Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon. My name is Amy Draves, and I'm here to introduce Susan Kane, who is joining us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Susan is here today to discuss her book, Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. We all know introverts in our lives. They are the coworkers that would prefer to listen than to speak, or would choose to work independently rather than participate in a group brainstorming session. The reality is that introverts are often undervalued in the current culture of American business, and we lose a lot by continuing to undervalue them. Before becoming an author, Susan Cain worked as a corporate lawyer and, an, and as a negotiations consultant. Um, and Quiet is one of January's, January's Amazon's Best of the Month, and it just hit number four on the New York Times bestseller list in its first week of publication. It is her first book. Please join me in wel giving her a very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Can you all hear me? Excellent. OK. Well, I want to talk to you today about introversion and extroversion, which I have come to believe are as profound a part of our identities as our gender. And that, therefore, it's extremely important to know where we fall on the introvert-extrovert spectrum. And when I say this, I'm not talking about where do you appear to fall. Um, I, I'm, because in this extroverted culture of ours, we all tend to act a lot more extroverted than we really are, right? So I'm talking about who are you really if you could spend your time exactly as you please, your, your work days, your weekends, would you be more of an introvert or would you be more of an extrovert? And we're going to try to answer this question very quickly. So what I'm going to ask you to do is just to quickly break up into groups of six, and we're going to come together and have you all share a very private, personal, and profound experience from your childhoods that you think illuminates who you are. <laughs> and then we're going to pick the most private and the most personal out of these groups and share them with the entire audience. Yeah, right, I'm just kidding. <laughs> We're not really going to do that. Um, <laughs> but for the brief moment when you thought I was actually serious, <laughs> how are you feeling and what were you thinking? Um, <laughs> right. You were probably thinking, like, how do I get out of the room right now without insulting the speaker? Um, or I don't know, maybe there were some of you, were there some of you who were thinking that actually sounds like a nice chance to chat? <laughs> <laughs> OK, not so much. Well, let's just take a quick, uh, a quick show of hands. How many of you would say you are introverts? Oh my gosh, it might actually be 100%. <laughs> Let me ask it the other way. Any extroverts in the room? OK, so probably, what, maybe 4 or 5% of you. OK, so the real question is, why? You know, what, what is it that makes you an introvert? What is it that makes you an extrovert? These are terms that we kind of throw around, but I don't think that we really know what we mean by them. And it turns out that what's at the bottom of all of this is the amount of stimulation that you like. So introverts are people who prefer lower levels of stimulation. And I'm talking about social stimulation, but I'm talking about other kinds of stimulation in general. Generally speaking, there are exceptions. Introverts would prefer you know, less noise, more quiet, that kind of thing. Um, whereas extroverts really do truly crave more stimulation for them to feel at their best and to feel most energized. Um, so this is why an introvert would generally socially rather have um, a glass of wine with a close friend as opposed to go to a party full of strangers. And you'll note when I say this that um, that I'm giving you a social example, because I, I think there's a really problematic misconception about what introversion is. We tend to equate it to some degree with being antisocial. And it's not that. It's just a different way of being social. You know, it, it's seeking a kind of quieter way of being social. Um, but, but it's also, as I said, about other kinds of stimulation. And this is important to understand. So for example, uh, the, the psychologist Russell Gein did a study 
where he had people solve math problems, introverts and extroverts, with different levels of background noise playing. And what he found was that the introverts solved the problems more quickly, more effectively, when the noise was lower, when the background noise was lower. Um, and the extroverts performed better when the background noise was higher. And this is a really important thing to understand because what it's telling us is that we kind of all have sweet spots, I like to call them, you know, sweet spots of how much stimulation we need to feel at our best. Um, and if we can manage to set up our lives so that we are living as much as possible within our sweet spots, both socially and acoustically and everything else, then we will tend to be at our most powerful. Now, the reason I wrote this book is because for introverts, it's really hard to do that. It's really hard to do that because we live in a society that is organized for extroverts. You know, the, the stimulation levels are all kind of set up to maximize the energies of extroverts in general, um, and less so for introverts. And it may be different, actually, at a company like Microsoft. So I'd love to hear from you guys when, when we get to the Q&A at the end. Um, but in general, in our culture, the bias against introversion, it's so deep and it's so profound. And we internalize it from such an early age. We don't even realize that we're doing it. But you know, it, it happens young from the minute a, a child goes off to preschool and they're immediately presented with a group environment that they're supposed to be plunging right into. And if they don't, they sense that they're not meeting some kind of a social norm. They, they know it at a very young age. Um, and, and teachers have been shown to believe, that the majority of teachers believe that the ideal student is an extrovert. Even though, by the way, introverted kids get better grades in general. Same thing in many workplaces. And again, I would love to hear your experiences here. But we are increasingly setting up our workplaces so that people have to be you know, kind of interacting all day long in open plan offices. And when it comes to leadership, when it comes to leadership, we find that introverts are routinely passed over for leadership positions in favor of extroverts, even though recent research by Adam Grant at the Wharton School tells us that introverted leaders often deliver better outcomes than extroverts do. They deliver better outcomes. And the reason is, by the way, that they are less if they are managing proactive employees who are creative and kind of generating their own ideas, an introverted leader is much less likely to try to kind of put their own stamp on things. Um, and instead, they let other people run with their ideas and let them implement them. Whereas an extroverted leader might uh, quite unwittingly um, just be sort of dominant and not letting other ideas come to the fore. Now, I also want to talk to you about kind of on a deeper and a more profound level, the way in which our society would be a better place and might, might literally depend, the, the survival and the, the thriving of our society might depend on having a real balance of power between introverts and extroverts. And the way I'm going to show this to you at first, it's gonna be, it's, I'm gonna start in a kind of unlikely place, but I wanna start by taking you with me to a colony of fruit flies and to the animal kingdom in general. We're gonna start with fruit flies and then we're gonna make our way up to humans. One of the most interesting things I learned when I was researching my book is that there are animal introverts and animal extroverts in many different species throughout the animal kingdom. I mean, like, who, who knew? <laughs> but it's true. And when you look at fruit flies, you find that they're what biologists call sitter fruit flies and they're rover fruit flies. And the sitter fruit flies are exactly what they sound like. They kind of tend to, you know, sort of hop up and down in place. And the rover fruit flies are much more exploratory and they kind of go roaming the, the outer margins of fruit fly society. And they do this for a reason. They do this because they have different survival strategies. Each one does better in different kinds of conditions. And I wanna illustrate this by moving now a little bit up, further up the chain of the animal kingdom. I'm gonna to talk to you about pumpkin seed fish and this fascinating experiment that was done by an evolutionary biologist named David Sloan Wilson, who he went to this pond of, of where he found lots of pumpkin seed fish and, and he dropped a gigantic trap right into the middle of the pond. And an event which he says from the fish's perspective must have seemed you know, as alien as a spaceship landing in the middle of Times Square. And what happened? What he found was that the more introverted fish 
sort of hovered judiciously on the sidelines of the pond and didn't get anywhere near the trap that David Sloan Wilson had put in. And the more extroverted fish, the rover fish, they were like, what's that thing in the middle of the pond? I've got to go check it out. And they went swimming right up to it and they were immediately trapped. And so, you know, had that, had that trap been an actual predator in that scenario, it was the extroverted fish who would have perished and the introverted fish who would have survived. But now here's the flip side. A few days later, David Sloan Wilson comes back and this time he has fishing nets and he manages to scoop up the introverted fish as well. And he carries them back to his lab where the extroverted fish are already waiting for them. Um, and he tracks what happens once they're back in their lab. And he finds that in that situation, you know, an alien, an alien condition, the extroverted fish adapt much more quickly. And they start eating more quickly and they start roaming around and exploring and they're comfortable, which is, of course, exactly the behavior that we see with human extroverts, right? You know, they're just sort of immediately more comfortable um, in a new surrounding. And so in that kind of a situation, it's much better to be an extrovert. And I tell you all this at great length because you will start to see that this has parallels throughout the human condition as well. And so now let me talk to you about humans, about sitters and rovers, about, about introverts and extroverts. And I want to start by talking to you about children because, and because children are incredibly important because whether or not you have children of your own, um, the thing about kids is that they haven't yet learned to act in ways that are foreign to their true natures. And so the way they act actually tells us a lot about who we really are. So let me ask you, how many of you, how many of you have kids? Okay, a lot of you. And how many of you have ever been to a kind of, you know, mommy and me or daddy and me type of class, like a you know, music class where you all sit around? Okay. So for those of you who haven't been, I'm going to show you a picture. <laughs> this is what this kind of a class looks like. So it's basically, it's a bunch of parents and babysitters sitting in a circle with the kids and their job is to be there singing songs and, and playing musical instruments. And what you find when you go to a class like this, you find that half of the kids, roughly, are behaving like sitters, meaning that they are cleaving to their parents' laps. They're not going to explore. They're, they're watching from the sidelines. And then the other half are just exploring as if there's nothing in their way. Like that little kid, do you see that baby in the red jumpsuit? He's right there in the middle of the room. He has no idea where his mom is, and <laughs> it's okay with him. Now, the thing about these kinds of classes is, I know from years of researching, of interviewing parents, that the parents of the sitter children tend to get really worried about their children because they feel like, oh my gosh, you know, this mommy and me class is just, it's, it's symbolic of what's going to become of my child for the rest of his or her life. They're going to sit on the sidelines. They're not going to participate. No one's going to know who they are. Um, they're not going to get the best that this world has to offer. And they really worry. So let's, 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 let's track the, the development of these two kinds of children to see whether this worry is warranted. Now, the rover children, I think we already kind of know what their development is. They tend to be very, um, very bold, very exploratory. These are kids who will make friends very easily. When they grow older, it'll be easier for them to strike up new business deals. It's kind of, you kind of know the picture. The children who are more on the sidelines, here's the important thing to understand about them. It seems as if they're just sitting there kind of passively and inertly, but that's not actually what's happening. These children are doing what psychologists call paying alert attention to things. They're paying alert attention. And so very often, they will ultimately plunge into whatever the social scenario is. And sometimes it takes them minutes, and sometimes it's days or weeks or months. But they will plunge in eventually. And when they do, they understand the rules of the game. And they usually understand it with a kind of subtlety that is born of, of this kind of close attention. And so, so the thing about these children is that they're, kind of, they're noticing scary things, but they're also noticing more things in general. And I'm just going to give you an example of how this plays out cognitively and intellectually, because these children really do have a different intellectual way of interacting with the world. Um, if you give these kinds of kids this type of a game, which is you know, two pictures that look very similar, and the job is to just spot the subtle differences between them, these children will spend more time 
figuring out the difference between the two pictures and they will more often get the right answer. And this, and this, this is true all the way into adulthood. Um, once these children grow up, if you give them problems to solve, they will spend more time at the problems and they will more often get the right answer. And you know, uh, one example of this is somebody like an Einstein who famously said that it's not that I'm so smart, it's just that I stick with problems longer. <laughs> And this really is a very effective style. Um, and so introverts, as I said before, they've been shown to get better grades. They more often um, get, have Phi Beta Kappa keys. They do, they do well intellectually in general. And the other thing about them, and I'm sorry extroverts, but introverts actually know more about, <laughs> they, they know more about many subjects than extroverts do. There was one really interesting study where they, they tested college freshmen in 21 different subjects, you know, ranging from art to astronomy to physics to statistics. And the introverts knew more than the extroverts about every single one of the subjects. And what's important about this is that it's not that the introverts were more intelligent, because as a group, the introverts and extroverts are equal when it comes to IQ scores. So it has nothing to do with intelligence. It's rather that the very behavioral style that our culture excoriates in introverts is actually a boon when it comes time to sitting down and solving problems and strategizing and thinking things through. It leads to a kind of quiet persistence that can, that can take you very far. Second difference between these two kids, the, these two kinds of kids that I was telling you about, they have very profoundly different orientations to risk. Um, I didn't know this when I started doing my research. It was kind of news to me. But introverts approach risk in a much more circumspect way than extroverts do. So extroverts are much more likely, when, when they see something that they want, their mode is to just kind of orient themselves to the goal and just go for it. And, and this is actually a neurochemical difference. Extroverts have stronger reward networks in their brain. Um, so when they see the thing that they desire, whether it's a promotion or, or um, a business deal or whatever it happens to be, they're, they get really excited and they start having very joyous, fizzy emotions um, that, that are quite delightful. And I think it's because of these emotions that, that extroverts enjoy the admiration that they do because it's a kind of champagne bubble quality that's quite lovely. But the downside of these emotions that I don't think we pay attention to is that when you're in this kind of state of orienting to a goal, you literally don't see as much warning signals that are standing in your way. You just don't see them. Um, and this has been shown in the lab. So introverts are much more likely to be able to see the warning signs. And this is why if, you know, if you're a group or if you're an organization, you really need to make sure that you are equally honoring structurally both types of people because you need both of these viewpoints. Um, extroverts more likely to get into car accidents, more likely to place large financial bets, and uh, more likely to, to participate in extreme sports. Um, and, but what I want to say here is that it's not that introverts don't take risks at all. It's not that at all. And in fact, a study of a London investment bank found that the most proficient traders the, the most successful traders were introverts. Um, and Warren Buffett you know, is a perfect example of this. He's a self-described introvert, and his MO really is to very carefully, very analytically um, take, take the measure of an entire situation, warning signs at all. So it's not an accident that he is famously admired for having sat out the two gigantic bubbles of the past years, you know, the, the tech bubble and the housing market crash, Warren Buffett was not participating in them. That's very, that, that's characteristic behavior. Okay. Um, yeah, and I do want to say, by the way, about this, I think that the issue that we have in our culture in general is we, we lionize too much the kind of attitude that really celebrates risk-taking at all costs, the, the seizing the day, attitude. And I saw this myself when I was a Wall Street lawyer. I, I practiced Wall Street law back in the 90s. And um, this was, of course, during some of the real go-go times. And at the time, I heard a story that was circulating on Wall Street about a group of bankers who were pitching for some new business. And they wanted to distinguish themselves from the other bankers that were, were competing. And so what they did is 
they came into the pitch room, all of them dressed in, in matching uniforms. And on the matching uniforms were written the three letters F-U-D. And F-U-D stood for fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And they had a big X through the F-U-D. And so their message to their potential um, clients was, you come with us and you will have no fear, you will have no uncertainty, you will have no doubt. And I would argue that it's that kind of attitude and you know, the, the lionization of that kind of attitude that has led to some of the problems that we've seen. And so we need much more of a balance between the two orientations. Okay, uh, running out of time. So I'm gonna tell you about one, a, a third thing that distinguishes these children I was just telling you about. And that is creativity. That's creativity. Studies have shown us that the most spectacularly creative people in a wide variety of fields have tended to be introverts. Not, any, not just any introverts, they're introverts who also have a social component to them. So they're people who are comfortable exchanging ideas and they're comfortable advancing ideas, um, but they also have the need to kind of go off by themselves and focus on the thing they're doing. And this is important because we can all learn from this. These introverts, they're not necessarily, it's not that they have some you know, intrinsic magic button that they press that makes them more creative. It's rather that solitude turns out to be a crucial ingredient to creativity and that we're living in a culture right now that is telling us that the answer to creativity is to bring people together in groups um, and, and to be functioning in groups. But introverts are people who will go off by themselves and do what they need to do. You know, and, and this is not to say that groups don't have that they don't have an important place in any kind of a creative or productive measure. But the thing is that when you are in a group of people, you literally, you can't think, you, you can't think in the same way that you would independently. It turns out that we are such social creatures, all of us, introverts included, we're such social creatures that if we're with a group, we instinctively start to mimic the opinions of the people in the group without even realizing that we're doing it. So even something that is as seemingly private and as seemingly visceral as who you're attracted to, you, it, it, if I show you pictures of, uh, of faces and I ask you to rate how attractive they are, if you're in a group of people, you will start literally responding like in your brain uh, um, with more attraction towards the faces of people who your fellow group members have already deemed attractive. And this is not, as I'm saying, this is not something we can control. It's not something that we're doing because we want to fit in. It's just something that happens. The other thing that it can be dangerous about groups is that years of social psychology experiments tell us that when you come together in a group of people, invariably, the person who speaks the most effectively, the person who is most assertive, most dominant, that person's ideas end up getting listened to the most. And you know, I, I think we've all had this experience in our day-to-day -day lives. But the thing that you may not know is that there's a whole other raft of studies that have found that there is zero correlation, I mean, zero correlation between being the best talker and having the best ideas. So that person who is gaining the attention in a room may have the best ideas, but they may not. And so, you know, if, if you are charged with figuring out what the best brains in your organization have to say about whatever question it is, and your answer is to gather people into a room and see what everybody says, you're probably not going to get the best ideas. So you need to come up with other ways to do it, ways that honor the solitary thinking process as well, um, together with the group one. So having said all this, I, I do want to be really clear about what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that man is an island after all, um, and that we should all just go off by ourselves and never talk to each other again. Um, that's not the point. Uh, we, we are human beings and we love each other and we need each other. And life is meaningless without love and it's meaningless without trust and without friendship. And I'm also not saying that we should abolish group work altogether or teamwork altogether. And this is especially true today. We can't do it because the problems we need to solve are so complex that we can't solve them literally without standing on each other's shoulders and working together to some degree. Um, but what I am saying is that human nature is really 
it, it has kind of two competing poles. And there's one pole that has us longing to be with each other, and there's one pole that has us craving privacy and craving solitude and craving autonomy. And we need to figure out ways of fueling both of these drives in order to have everybody functioning at their best. And that this is true of everybody. It's true of introverts in particular, but it's true to some degree of us all. So I want to just leave you with three thoughts, and then I want to open this up to Q&A and hear what you have to say. Um, I'm going to leave you three kind of calls to action. The first one is, I hope that you will all just make more time to sit still and be quiet and think and be yourselves without feeling guilty about it. I mean, the, the primary thing I found when I was doing my research is that people feel guilty about wanting to go off by themselves because it has been so instilled in us that this is a, a bad, negative, antisocial thing to do, and it's just not. Second thing is, we need to honor the next generation of quiet children. You know, the, the kids who are sitting on their parents' laps in the mommy and me class, and the kids who, when they're teenagers, develop deep passions for spider taxonomy or for 19th century art and want to go off by themselves and pursue those passions, those kids should be honored and not made to feel weird. They should, th these kinds of talents and these kinds of orientations should be cultivated. And then finally, I want to kind of come back to where we started. And I want to ask you to think again in private um, not in a group, about who you really are and what makes you feel powerful and what made you feel powerful when you were a child. Because we all know from the lessons of myths and from the lessons of fairy tales that there are many different kinds of powers that are available to us in this world. This is what myths tell us. You know, Luke Skywalker is granted a lightsaber with which to swashbuckle his way through the galaxies. And, and Harry Potter gets a wizard's education but there are some kids, there are some quiet kids, where the power that they are granted is a key to a secret garden that is full of inner private riches. And that is a power too. And so the trick for all children now, for all of us now that we're grown up, <laughs> the trick is to use whatever power we've been granted and to use it as best we can. And so that is what I wish for you all, whether you have been given a lightsaber <laughs> or whether you have been given a key to a private garden. I hope that you will use the power that you've been given, and I wish you all the best with it. And thank you very much. And now what I would love to do, we have some time, so I'd love to hear your questions. You can ask me anything. Yes? Do any research relative to virtual collaboration, where you don't, you're not actually in a room together? Yes, this is such a good question. Um, really interesting. So there's all this research on in-person brainstorming, 40 years worth of research, literally, that finds that in-person brainstorming is a disaster and that individuals always do better than groups. Um, but the one exception to this is when groups brainstorm electronically. And, and it's thought that the reason that electronic brainstorming or collaboration works is because it removes a lot of the social barriers that exist when you come together with a group of people. Um, you know, and there's a number of these barriers. Like one of them is just that if you're in a group of people in the same room, all participating at the same time, really only one person can think at the same time. One person's talking, one person's thinking. Everybody else is oriented to what that person is saying. But when you're working kind of asynchronously in an online group, that is removed. And then the other thing is, it turns out if you are in a group of people face to face and one person dissents from what the group says, um, that person it has been found by the neuroscientist Gregory Burns at Emory University. Um, he, he found that the amygdala, which is the small organ in our brain that is associated with the fear of social rejection, um, that, that the amygdala in your brain becomes very activated at the moment that you are dissenting. And he calls this the pain of independence. You know, and, and he says this is what is wrong with some of our jury trials, for example. You've got people in a room and it is painful to dissent. But when you're working collaboratively, a lot of that problem is removed. I'm sorry, when you're working electronically. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. First of all, thanks a lot for this topic, actually. It's very interesting. You're welcome. It's getting some light into this. Uh, I managed to work by nature, so I'm one of your four hands that went up. <laughs> so, uh, my question is, uh, by nature, I'm an extrovert. Yeah. I find myself shifting into an introvert mode a lot of times, within a day or within a month, or, right? So 
there seem to be categories and pieces, two separate things by itself. And I think there's, there's what I am by nature and what I am by habit. And there's a mix here, but I, what are your thoughts on the mix? Yeah, thank you. That's an important question. Um, so a couple of things about that. For one thing, you know, introversion and extroversion is really a spectrum, and we all fall at different parts along the spectrum. Um, but even for those of us who fall at one extreme or the other, we all still have aspects of the other side in us. You know, this is not a, a black and white thing. And I'm, I'm talking about it in black and white terms just to make a broad point to you. But we are, of course, all a kind of glorious mishmash of many different traits. And as I think you're getting at, um, our traits can change a little, but they, they can change to some extent over time, depending on how we spend our day-to-day -day lives. So, for example, you know, an introvert who is not comfortable going to cocktail parties, but who goes to them day after day after day after day, will probably over time get more comfortable, but they'll still be an introvert. And it sounds like you're having a, an opposite experience. Yes? Um, have you done any studies uh, around the relationship between uh, being an introvert and having anxiety? Yeah, also an important question. And are you talking about social anxiety or just general anxiety? Uh, good question. Uh, probably a little bit of both, but uh, I'm just, let's go with social anxiety. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is interesting because culturally we tend to think of introversion and shyness as being pretty much the same thing. In fact, they're quite different. Introversion is, just as I was saying, the, the preference for lower stimulation environments. And shyness is much more about a fear of social judgment. And the two do overlap, but psychologists debate to what degree they overlap. Yes? I have two questions. Um, one which is what surprised you the most when you were researching the book. Mm -hmm. The other one was more like, I kind of had this theory in my head for a long time because I can be social and I can appear like an extrovert in some situations, but when I go home at night, I really just want to be alone after a day of, of socializing, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I, I often think about how much um, how much introverts maybe don't, it isn't that they don't want to be extroverts, it's that maybe they just don't have the right set of people to, to stimulate them. Because I always see like certain sets of people, if you get them with their best friend, yeah, yeah. all of a sudden they get super social. And so like, how much of it is that they're, they're truly introverted people, or it's just that they're, they're not with the right set of people to make them to, to raise their stimulus level? Yeah, these are tricky questions. And you know, Carl Jung, who was the first psychologist to popularize the terms introvert and extrovert back in the 1920s, he actually talks about exactly what you're saying, about how if you get an introvert with the right group of people, um, I think the way he puts it is he will relax into being an extrovert. Um, so then the question is, well, does that mean he's really an extrovert as long as he's with the right group of people? Or is it that that's actually characteristic of an introvert, that they, they kind of um, come outward only in more limited circumstances, whereas with an extrovert, they'll, they'll come outward no matter what? Um, and then as, for your question about what surprised me the most, I don't know if this is... What surprised me, but it really struck me. Um, I, I have a lot of profiles in my book about introverted leaders. And this was very important to me because there's such a deep-seated notion, I think, that there really is only one way to be a good leader. You know, I, I think we think of leaders as being very bold and very charismatic types of figures. But I saw, but, but in my book, I, I profiled a number of transformative leaders over time, um, people like Rosa Parks and, and Gandhi and Eleanor Roosevelt, and then some people in the business world too. And one of the things that you find with these leaders is that the reason they're as effective as they are is precisely because they don't like the spotlight. So if you don't like the spotlight, but you're really motivated by a cause, or you're really motivated to serve your organization well, that's a, that's a kind of pure motive. And the people who you're asking to follow you sense its purity, and, and they sense that you're not motivated by narcissism, and that can be a real power of its own. Um, and you know, Jim Collins, who's the famous management researcher who wrote the book Good to Great, he did this famous study where he identified the 11 top performing companies of a particular period of time, and he tried to figure out what it was that distinguished these companies. You know, why, why these 11? Why had they risen to the top? And initially, he didn't want to look at leadership at all because he thought that that would be too easy an answer, too, too glib an answer. But what he started to notice, he and his team, was that 
every single one of the leaders of these companies, every single one of them, they were all people who were described by their employees with a certain kind of constellation of traits, you know, um, shy, humble, self-effacing, modest, this kind of thing. Um, and they were also people who had great will and great visions for their companies. And he came to call this, this combination of traits level five leadership, um, which, which then led to this kind of funny scenario of he would go out and present this to, to groups of quite alpha type A leaders and they would raise their hands and say, how can I become more of a level five leader? <laughs> you know, how can I become more shy and unassuming? <laughs> Not so easy. Uh, Amy. I have a couple questions from online. One is, um, it seems like social networks like Facebook empower introverts. Is there any research about that? Yeah, there is. And um, although, you know, of course, like everything with the internet, it's changing all the time. So historically, historically in internet times, um, the, in the internet has been a place where introverts have been empowered. And in fact, uh, a poll done by, social, by um, Mashable, the social media website, found that most of its users were introverts, as is, by the way, Pete Cashmore, who started it. Um, but one thing that is, oh, oh, and then there was another study that found that introverts said that they, they felt that they could express the real me online um, in ways that they couldn't do in person, all of which makes perfect sense, right? But, you know, now it's starting to fragment more, and we're starting to see that the mainstream social media sites, in particular Facebook, have become more havens for extroverts. Um, so introverts use them, but, but not quite as much or with the same glee. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, and that's not so surprising when you think about it, because so much of Facebook is about a kind of self-presentation and how many friends do you have and this kind of thing. Um, and what I've observed anecdotally is that introverts tend to like more a site like a live journal where you're doing more long in-depth diary entries and sharing them with a select group of people, um, or blogging where, you know, it's really about your thoughts that you're presenting in-depth, that kind of thing. Yes? Did you do any research about uh, what drives people to make friendship and partnership choices based on their, their extroversion, their introversion profile? Yeah, my yeah. Wife, my wife, for example, is extreme introvert, and I'm not. Right. I, I know that that's pretty common. It is. A lot of people, so I'm wondering why that might be. You know, it seems to be that there really is a kind of mutual attraction. Um, so in marriages, the statistic is about 50%, that, you know, half the marriages are introvert-extrovert marriages. Um, and I'm in that kind of marriage, too. I'm an introvert, and my husband's an extrovert. Um, and, and it happens, though, also, even at the level of teams at work, it's been found that the most effective teams in organizations tend to be a mix of introverts and extroverts because the two types are just drawn to each other. You know, I, I think we all know yin and yang when we, when, when we see it. Um, we all know that there are traits of ours that we need to complement. You know, we have our strengths and then there are things we're not so good at. Um, so that's really what lies at the heart of, of many of these friendships, too. Um, in, in social relationships, it's been found that what happens is introverts, when they're around extroverts, they feel like they're, the extroverts bring out their more carefree side. You know, and they, they kind of feel more up and more alive and more light when they're with an extrovert. And then extroverts, on the other hand, appreciate introverts because the introverts allow them to talk about more serious things that they might otherwise either not think to go to or might feel uncomfortable going to. Um, but, you know, I should say, too, this really is true also at the highest levels of leadership. You know, if you look at many leaders, you will see them, effective leaders, you'll see them trying to complement their own strengths. Um, and I was just thinking about this yesterday. I'm, I'm reading the book, The Obamas, by Jody Cantor, all about the Obama administration. And I believe Obama, President Obama is an introvert. And it's actually fascinating to see, I don't know if it's deliberate or not, but how much he is always choosing partners who can complement his introverted tendencies. Um, so, you know, Michelle Obama is a real extrovert, and she's, she's very often the one who is urging him to connect more directly with his audiences. And he chose as his first chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel, who's much more combative than he is, um, because, you know, he's kind of, Obama's famously not a combative person, like many introverts. Um, and there's one more. Oh, yeah, and Joe Biden as his running mate. You know, that's a perfect example. Joe Biden is the type of politician who, who loves to go out and do the glad-handing, back-slapping type of thing that Washingtonian politicians do and that Obama really doesn't do naturally. Um, so that's just one example, but there are many I could give you. Yeah. 
the the perception that society rewards extroverts is is pretty pervasive. Yeah. It's, it's funny because if you look at pumpkin seed fish or if you look at uh, uh, fruit flies, I mean, they don't reward extroversion or extroversion. And every, that's kind of ridiculous on its face because those you know those creatures don't have the complex social structures we do. They don't do things. Mm -hmm send their kids to school to work in groups or have right. big companies where there are a few leaders right. that tend to be extroverted and they haven't had moments in history like the Industrial Revolution where people started living more closely together in big cities. Right. Of all those kinds of things, what what do you think are the biggest reasons that society rewards extroverts? Can I, can I quickly add a question to that? Sure. Because we, we talk about society, we've been talking about biology, are you talking about American society, or is this very global? Are there more introvert-friendly cultures? <laughs> yeah, that's an important question. It was one of the first things that I looked at when I started my research, because I was really trying to figure out, is this preference for extroversion you know, somehow innate to humanity, or does it vary across cultures? And I really found quite a difference from culture to culture. Um, and particularly, I focused on Far Eastern cultures, where there's actually a branch of psychology called cross-cultural psychology, and psychologists study this quite a bit. Um, you know, there's more, particularly in the Confucian belt cultures of the Far East, there's much more reverence for, um, for silence and for reserve. And the person who doesn't speak so much is often seen as being wise and very judicious. Um, and words themselves are perceived as being potentially dangerous because you know, words can hurt other people, um, words can hurt the person who uttered them if you say the wrong thing at the wrong time. So they're really quite different attitudes. Um, and in fact, there was one study that compared Chinese school children with Canadian school children, and they found that among the Chinese school children, the students who were either quiet or shy were often um, admired by their peers and seen by their teachers as great candidates for leadership positions. And in Canada, of course, the exact opposite thing was true. Um, but you know, depending on your perspective, the thing that's sad is that this is starting to change. And they actually repeated this study recently and got quite different results with the things in the Chinese schoolyard being much more similar to what's happening in the West because these attitudes are starting to shift. You know, just, just the way um, Western, Western McDonald's is being um, exported globally, the same thing is true of our sense of the ideal self. So going back to the corporate social uh, interaction. Yeah. If you're sitting in a room with 12 and two are introverts and 10 are extroverts, how do you apply pressure to get that team not to uh, isolate and be biased against the, the quiet people in the room? Yeah, um, good question. I believe that these changes have to come about mostly structurally, if you're talking about at work. You know, I, I don't think it's really going to work to say, OK, assertive people, remember to pay attention to the less assertive ones. Um, so instead, thinking about structures that work, um, for example, saying before a meeting, um, we're going to distribute the agenda of the meeting in advance so that everybody can prepare. Because um, one of the primary things introverts com complain about in meetings is that the meeting is going quickly and they tend not to think as fast like that. They're not thinking on their feet. And so they often feel like, oh, I thought of the thing I wanted to say, but by then the meeting was over. Um, so, but the structures so for the person who can go into that 15 or 30 minute meeting get the gist of the idea of make ABC this is what we're going to do this is how we're going to move forward right the reward structure is clearly or feels very clearly <laughs> set for the extrovert right uh, and so the question is uh, from, a, from a personal action plan like I said I'm sitting in two of 12 yeah you know, how do I uh, how do I um, manage myself into a different place. Oh, gotcha. Okay, right. Yes, okay. What are some things that introverts can do when they're in that setting? Yeah. Did everyone hear that question? What, what can introverts do when they're in a meeting and they feel like they're sort of um, outnumbered by extroverts who are communicating with a different style? Um, so, you know, the trick with all this stuff is figuring out how to use your own self in a way that that is strong. So, for example, for, it might be you prepare before the meeting, even if nobody else has, and you have your ideas that you want to get across. And making sure to, to state your ideas pretty early on in the meeting is helpful, because research shows that we tend to pay atten more attention to the ideas that are um, advanced quickly or advanced early. Um, and then there are things like, you know, if, if the idea that you're advancing, if you feel conviction about it, 
you don't necessarily need to say it in the loudest voice for people to feel your conviction. Um, so the key is, is kind of testing your ideas beforehand to know how much you really believe in them. And if you do, just making sure to get them out there. Um, another role that introverts can play very effectively is being the person who asks the thoughtful questions that redirect the group into a, a, direct, into a place that makes sense. Because, you know, we've all been in those meetings where like, you're off talking about God knows what and everyone's all excited and no one even realizes that you're off on a tangent. So the person who gets you all back to where you're going ends up getting a lot of power in the room. I um, received from a person that organized this meeting yeah. is that um, to connect with the people that are going to be participating in the meeting prior to the meeting yes. as much as possible mm -hmm. so that, that people would know who you are and what kind of opinion you would have. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. And for many introverts, that's much more comfortable, right? Instead of trying to forge bonds with 10 people at once in a meeting, which usually requires just playing a dominant role so that everybody knows who you are. Um, it can be much more comfortable and effective to just build these alliances kind of one-on-one, -on -one, behind the scenes, before the meeting happens, but also after. Um, that's another thing. After the meeting, you might be the one who actually takes the 10 minutes to sit down and think about what did we just say here? Um, what, are, where, what are the ways that I can build on what was just said? And maybe you send out a memo that summarizes things and advances the ball. Um, so it's like if you're comfortable with more with writing than with speaking, use that and make the most of it. Amy. Uh, does your research show any data about how introverts and extroverts handle stress? How do you handle stress? It's interesting. You know, I would say that introverts who tend to um, who tend to be on the anxious side of the spectrum, and I was saying some are and some aren't, they probably uh, suffer stress a little bit more and need to pay attention to stress management techniques more than uh, more than a non-anxious extrovert would. But I haven't seen a great deal of data on that. The second question that's sort of similar, um, which was, it seems like a lot of celebrities, musicians, sports figures self-describe as introverts, yeah. but simultaneously thrive on or excel at large-scale public performance. Did any, any of your research discuss this apparent self contradiction yeah, this is a fascinating subset of introverts. I, I met a lot of these people in my research. And I, I don't know if you all heard the question, but Amy's basically asking about the phenomenon of introverted performers um, who, who seem to thrive on public performance but describe themselves as introverts. And how can this be? So I, I was fascinated by these people, and I interviewed them. And what they told me is that they tend to experience the audience as just one, one unit. So they're not feeling intimidated by speaking or performing for 100 people at once. They feel like they're just having a conversation with one person. And they also tend to feel that they're more comfortable in that kind of a setting than they are just chatting one-on-one, because -on -one, they feel like it's a situation where they can totally control what's happening. Um, and that they're kind of appearing behind a mask to some extent. Because you know, we've all had that sensation when you go to a costume party and you're wearing, you, you have a mask on or you've got your costume. Um, you can often feel more liberated than you would if you were just going as yourself. And this is the way actors often describe their craft. I think we probably have time for one more question. So, so I just wonder, yeah. follow the, 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 question, the question Amy just asked us. I just wonder, do we have a clear and uh, universal and uh, all the people agree what's the definition of the introvert and uh, extrovert? Because some like a, the one who can speak loudly on, on the large audience and uh, is, is this people really uh, introvert? I was kind of curious whether we really have such a classifier can can be universal across yeah. even even like the, the culture wise that like you mentioned in China for example if if, if the different ranking system different culture actually mm -hmm. maybe it's different standard when you when you classify in the introvert or extrovert in China and in the right. US right and uh, so do we have such the standard for the introvert or extrovert yeah at all? no it's a good question you know I I like to say that there are as many definitions of introversion and extroversion as there are personality psychologists. Um, they all have, every psychologist has his or her own definition. Um, they all kind of argue about it. Um, the one thing they do all agree on is that whatever introversion and extroversion are, they know they're important. You know, they, they all agree that, is, that it's pretty much the most salient aspect of human nature and that this is true across all cultures. Um, so the best, so I, I, I looked at the 
sort of the most primary of all these definitions, and the one that I thought was the most representative of all, you know, that most would agree on, is what I told you about stimulation. Um, and I, you know, and I think another way to think about it is, where do you get your energy from? Do you feel after when, when you've been out socializing, maybe you've had a really good time, um, but still, do you feel like now you need to recharge at home or in solitude, or do you feel like now you're all energized and you want more socializing? That, that in some ways is a real key distinction. Okay, so I think we could probably keep going, but I'm gonna have to catch a plane at some point. So I wanna thank you so much, and I'm gonna be at the back to sign your books if you would be interested. And um, you've been a wonderful audience, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.